What's going on, everybody? It's the Junkyard Dogcast. I'm Jake Rowe from Dogs 24-7, and it's just me today. I regret to inform you, uh, Kip and Rusty both kind of had some things pop up here at the last minute. Uh, they're fine. No uh, no big-time issues. I think Ruddy, Rusty's a little under the weather. Uh, Kip's battling a uh, an, uh, an old yoga injury. Uh, no, I don't know if it's yoga or not, but uh, he's uh, he's battling an injury of his own, and it's just me, uh, and I'm going to try not to injure you with my face and voice today, uh, but but I can't make any guarantees. Uh, you know, you're going to have to sign a waiver or something before you come in here. But let's talk Georgia, Alabama, SEC championship game. Uh, I think I mentioned this uh, when Rusty and I were on uh, Monday, but uh, it's exactly how I planned for it to be or, or projected it to be whenever I filled out my SEC media day ballot uh, back in, um, I guess it was July uh also incredible to be there for that in person and, and be back at it i'm not a big fan of it being in atlanta uh but but i do love it being in hoover um and uh, you know it was nice to be back in hoover and uh back at the winfrey hotel back in that setting there's a lot of energy felt great and uh feels like it was just yesterday i mean this season absolutely flew by but the plan today i've got a couple of points i want to get to then we're going to get the mailbag questions from the dogs 24 7 junkyard and then I'm going to get the questions uh, from you guys uh, here on the uh, on the YouTube live show. If you haven't subscribed, please do uh, tell you tell your friends about us. Let's get those subscribers up. Let's uh, let's get as many people watching this thing as possible uh, because I think come hell or high water, Georgia's in the playoff. I, I really do. I mean, unless Alabama just beats their brakes off on Saturday, I don't necessarily see that happen. I don't really. I mean, I think there's almost no chance of that happening. Uh, but but you know, I think that that Georgia's going to be in the playoff. Um, I think, based on what we saw last night, and I know a lot of people don't want to, you know, sit here and count the, you know, chickens before they hatch. But I think Alabama staying at number three means that if Alabama loses this game, even by a point, I think Alabama probably drops out. I think, you know, maybe that's a little bit more of a 50-50 proposition, but but my opinion on that is that Alabama drops out and it becomes a top four of whoever gets through this next weekend unscathed because, listen, chaos can absolutely ensue, ensue and that's what that's what blows my mind about, about Brian Kelly going ahead and taking this LSU job is, you know, Notre Dame, I mean, if you think about it, all you really – all that really has to happen – is Georgia to beat Alabama, uh, Oklahoma State to lose to Baylor, and uh, and and you know Notre Dame's in the thick of it at that point. Um, Michigan losing to Iowa, not out of the question. Uh, Cincinnati losing to Houston, not out of the question. If all four of those things happen, one hundred percent Notre Dame is in without a head coach. And you know I know some people. Uh, have written about well, it spells this, it spells that for college football. Listen, I'm, I, you know, and, and and I'm probably dragging on here before I get to my points, but I'm I'm so down on these harbinger of things to come in college athletics. Things changed. This game is nowhere near what it looked like 20 years ago, 10 years ago, much less 15, 20, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Okay, so the game changes. And things happen. I mean, coaches are making an astronomically more, uh, you know, larger salaries. All the buyouts. I mean, there's like a half half billion dollar in buyouts over the last ten years, or something like that. So this game's going to change. And uh, uh, but but I, I don't necessarily think Brian, you know, Brian Kelly, you know, doing that as shocking as it is, as weird as it is, is necessarily a, a sign of of things to come for this sport. And we all love it. We all want to see it survive. We all want to see it thrive. And I think we're in pretty good shape as far as those desires. So let's get to Georgia, Alabama. Um, I've been studying Alabama a lot. And, you know, there are people out there that that talk film. And we've got a couple of really good film pieces. I feel like, you know, I put them together and, and I feel like they're really good. They're really well thought out. I try not to, um, you know, get super technical and talk over people's heads or, or even try to talk over people's heads. I feel like a lot of people do that. There's a lot of definitive, this is what's happening, that's what's happening. We don't really do that over at Dogs 24-7. But I have watched a lot of Alabama, a lot. And, you know, the more I look at this matchup, this kind of gets me into my Wednesday lean, is this is a tough matchup for Georgia. 
when you look at Alabama's passing game and quarterback situation. This is going to be a tough match. I don't care if you, you can take the five most def- talented defensive backs Georgia has had over the past you know, 10 years, put them in the secondary, and Alabama's going to be a tough matchup for those guys because they're good. I mean, Jamison Williams, John Mechie, they're both fast. They're both great route runners. They do some things. Jalen Billingsley is inconsistent, but he's a matchup problem. Ja'Cory Brooks has all of a sudden kind of gotten his name into the mix there. And then Bryce Young, I feel like, is maybe one of the best Alabama quarterbacks to ever do it. Maybe the best to ever do it, to be honest with you, before it's all said and done. I would take him over to a – I would take him over Mac Jones. I would take him over Jalen Hurts. I think he's a stud. And I uh, had it post me on the radio the other day. Uh, you know, Georgia can rattle him. Uh, can Georgia rattle him uh, with the pass rush? I don't think you're going to rattle him. I think play to play, you can keep him from making plays, but but uh, you're not going to rattle him. But it's a tough matchup for Georgia, that passing game. All right, because I don't think Alabama necessarily has to run the football to get that passing game going. But I think it is a brutal matchup for Alabama with that offensive line and the running back situation. Cause I don't think Brian Robinson's going to play. And if he does, I don't think he's going to be very effective with, with that, with that offensive line against Georgia's defensive front and front seven and pressure packages and things of that nature. It's, it's tough. And, you know, my Wednesday lean is Georgia and Georgia covering in this game as of right now. I mean, listen, I, I, I think Alabama is Alabama's a, a wounded, Tired Cobra right now, but that Cobra still has sharp fangs and venom. And I think Georgia's got to be really, really cognizant of that, and Georgia's got to play good football. Uh, And I think it's one of those things where if Georgia comes in there and plays well, Georgia's going to win this game, and that's just all there is to it. I don't think Alabama can absorb an A or an A-plus game from Georgia and win this ball game, but but I do think Georgia – uh, you know, has to go in there and play well because I think Alabama's going to play well. And I said it earlier, 3,600 seconds, 3,600, not 60 minutes. Every single second of that ball game, Georgia's got to play. And Georgia's been outscored late in, in games against Alabama in the past, and, and, and they've got to do a better job of finishing. And that's what this one's going to come down to. Um, looking at Alabama's defense and, you know, against Georgia's offense – Alabama, technically, if you look at it, has a better run defense than Georgia. Ever so slightly, uh, yards per carry, Alabama's a little better than Georgia's. And uh, so, you know, this is one of those things where Georgia's offensive line is going to get tested here, you know, from a manhood standpoint. Can they get hat on hat? Can they block them up? Can they get that going? Because I don't know that Alabama, from studying them again, has the horses in the secondary to stack the line of scrimmage and try to cover Georgia one-on-one. I don't know that they have that. Um, so I think Alabama's going to have to mix it up. And then when Georgia gets one of those looks where they've got six on six, you know, five offensive linemen and a tight end against four defensive linemen and two linebackers, Georgia's needs Georgia has to make that a productive situation for themselves more often than not. And I think that is a major key to this game. Uh, but like I said, I have Georgia covering. Uh, I think Georgia's going to do that. We'll do our picks tomorrow. And I do think that this game is going to be a little lower scoring. Um, I've kind of had the same feeling on this one that I had on Clemson prior to the season. Uh, the the closer it got to the game, the the fewer points I saw being scored. And I think you might be looking 20 to teens type deal here in this game as the as, as the winner versus the loser. And we'll see how that goes. Let's jump into some mailbag questions here. And uh, L. John 70, listen, uh, good question right here off the start. Hearing anything on Lanning being the new OU head coach, Dan Lanning, uh, there are some reports out there that he's being considered. There's nothing on our end right now. Now, that doesn't mean that nothing's happening, but the thing, letting you behind the ropes here as a reporter, when you look at these coaching searches, it's oftentimes tough for the coach that you cover to, to know what the coach you cover is thinking about as far as that goes because there aren't a whole lot of uh, in-house sources, I would say, at Georgia that's going to tell you, hey, this guy's looking to move on. There are sources at the other school that's looking to lure that coach away saying this is who we want. Um, that's why a lot of the times the the national guys jump in on this stuff because they have these agent contacts. These agents kind of keep these national reporters warm because they're able to kind of float maybe a rumor out there that a guy's being considered for a job. 
and that's able to get their guy a raise. And so there's some back scratching that goes on there, and that's just part of the business. I'm not, I'm definitely not uh, uh, disparaging that at all. Uh, but that's kind of how that works. And as of right now, we haven't heard anything, and I don't think we will. I think this is a situation where, um, you know, if if Oklahoma, considering what Georgia's got going on right now, if Oklahoma is courting Dan Lanning, then um, we're not going to hear much about it. And they're probably not courting Dan Lanning himself. They're probably talking to his agent uh, more than likely. So we haven't heard anything yet. Uh, and, uh, you know, come on over to Dogs 24-7 a few times here throughout the day. Subscribe if you haven't. And uh, we'll um, we'll keep you updated on what we are hearing because we'll definitely let that out and you know pat ourselves on the back a little bit. We uh, we kind of had the George Pickens uh, making his comeback on uh, you know Friday morning. Although I'll be honest with you, I was kind of terrified about reporting that because so many different things can minds can change, setbacks can be experienced, soreness, whatever you know that could have you know come out, and that's kind of why we soft pedaled it. Uh, but we had heard, uh, you know, last week that Pickens was going to come back, and I'm interested to see how involved he's going to be in this game. Um, I think he's the kind of guy that can make an impact on this game without catching a pass. Uh, Dog fan six two three over under eleven and a half points for Alabama this weekend. I'll take the over. I think Alabama is going to be somewhere 14, 17, 20. Over under 25, 26 and a half points for Georgia this weekend. That's a tough one. That you know, I feel good about Alabama over eleven and a half. I'm going to say under for Georgia on 26 and a half this weekend. I'm going to say that. Over under 275 for Bennett this weekend. I'm going to say under. I see a 225 to 250 type game for Stetson. Uh, but but that's going to be dependent on can he hit a couple of explosives? Because if he can, you know, if, if he gets one out to Brock, Speedy Gonzalez, Bowers, okay, that I've never seen a tight end run like that. It's ridiculous. Uh, and, and, you know, they hit a couple of those 40, 50 yard plays, then, then I think he goes over, but, but I think it's going to be more of a, uh, more of a situation where Georgia, you're looking at Georgia kind of getting eight to 10, maybe 50, maybe 12 type plays that are, you know, between 10 and 20 yards as opposed to really big plays. Uh, but we'll see. It's all going to depend on how Alabama, how Alabama tries to play the run. Uh, Reedsville dog. What's up, man. Been to Reedsville before there's a prison there. I believe that's where Shannon Sharp and, uh, Sterling Sharper from. Uh, with the re-aggravation of Zamari Sawyer's foot, any chance he moves inside specifically for this game? You know, I spoke with somebody about this that was kind of knowledgeable uh, about that specific question, okay? And it's, uh, I think it's cool that you ask it uh, over the weekend. I believe it was Saturday or Sunday. Guards tougher to play with the plantar fascia injury that Jamari Sawyer's dealing with. And if you don't know what plantar fascia is, it's in the arch of your foot. And there's like a tear there and it's a pain tolerance deal. It's not really like you're going to make it a ton worse or blow your foot out or anything like that. Um, but there's a there's a little bit of a of a you know medium you got to find here. Yeah, you can kind of numb it up a little bit and and get him ready to play. Put an orthotic in there to kind of give him more support. But the power is what's going to hurt more than anything. Being light on his feet, there's going to be some you know there's going to be some discomfort there. But actually driving off of it. Is gonna what's gonna hurt more than anything, and so I think the foot injury, I think guard is even less likely than tackle. Um, and as of right now, mm, I would say forty five percent chance he plays. Uh, the, the, that's just me. And you know, I think if this was a situation where Broderick Jones hadn't started the past four games, maybe he would. Uh, but Jones has played that position. He's played. He's got four and a half meaningful games of experience this year. And I, th I think he's got what it takes to kind of hold up out there and, and be an athlete and, and to do the things that they need him to do. Uh, Lady C, does Georgia spy Bryce Young? And if so, who do they use? Yeah, they're going to spy him. They're going to spy him in some third down situations. They're going to probably use more than one spy in some situations because one thing I love that Georgia does, and I don't want to get too technical with this, you see Georgia go with a three-man rush, Right. And that three-man rush may be, you know, you may have Trayvon Walker in there at like a defensive tackle position, Jalen Carter over the nose, and then, uh, you know, maybe, uh, uh, you know, an edge guy like uh, Robert Beal or Channing Tindall coming off the – or Robert Beal coming off the left edge, okay? So you got a three-man rush there, and then you've got another guy lined up on the end line of scrimmage that says Nolan Smith. Well, they'll fold Nolan Smith back, and he'll be the spy if Bryce Young releases to the left side. Channing Tindall will be the spy if Bryce Young releases to the right side, which is the defense's left. Well, at that point, uh, 
you've really got five guys in the pass rush because if he decides to, you know, you've kind of maxed out the the zone behind those guys and, and he has to wait and he has to fade one way or the other. When he comes off the midline, when he comes off the midline, drifts to his left, one guy's going to get him. When he drifts off the midline going to his right, another guy's going to get him. And that's kind of how Georgia plays it. And I think that's a really good strategy for a quarterback like Bryce Young uh, because he's he's really he's listen, this guy's good, man. He is a good quarterback. I think Georgia can harass him and give him problems. Uh, but but they can, you know, he's the kind of guy you can you can blast him on one play and he's gonna come back and make another one on the next play. So, you know, I think George is definitely gonna spy him. I think you'll see Nolan Smith, I think you'll see Nicobe Dean, Channing Tindall, Quay Walker. You may even see them roll a safety or a star type guy up like Latavius Brini to kind of get after him too. Uh, let's take a break here real quick. And then on the other side, I'll get to some more of these dogs 24 seven questions and then get to your questions here in the YouTube channel. All right, let's get to this second half. Uh, I guess we call this the third quarter. It might be a kind of a quick third quarter, and then we put the fours up. Uh, all right, hunker down. Do Georgia beats Alabama and wins the SEC championship if. This, if Georgia scores more points than Alabama. I'm, I mean, I'm just joking. I mean, obviously, that's, that one's obvious. Uh, listen, there are a lot of different paths to victory for Georgia. And Josh Pate and I were talking about this. And, uh, you know, if you guys don't watch Lake Kick with Josh Pate, do it. I mean, you want to talk about the best dude ever. Uh, he's awesome, and he's got great takes on college football. And, 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 and that's one of the things he pointed out, and I agreed with it, was that Georgia's got a number of paths to victory, and Alabama's are more limited. Doesn't mean Alabama can't win this game. Um, but, but, you know, I, I do think – that uh that you know Georgia has more paths to victory. I think the quickest path to victory for Georgia is to be able to run the football. Alabama has been really good against the run and Georgia has been a little bit inconsistent at times. I think it's really overblown. I mean super overblown based on the comments I see about how bad Georgia's been at running the ball. Georgia doesn't have a thousand yard rusher, okay, but you look at the yards per carry. Um you look at the way Georgia's been able to run the ball when it needs to run the ball. Georgia's been good at that. And so I think that that Georgia's going to need a focused effort from that offensive line. And the quickest path to victory, the most direct path to victory, is for Georgia to be able to run the ball and run the ball effectively. Uh, flood the swamp. How do you see UGA's tackles holding up against the pass, ru pass rush of Will Anderson? Does Broderick Jones at left tackle give you any hesitation going into Saturday? I've got hesitations for every offensive tackle in the country against Will Anderson. I would have some hesitations with Andrew Thomas against Will Anderson. Not because I don't think anybody can can ever block him, but he's going to get his. You know, Cole Kubelik, I remember talking with him uh, not, I mean, probably a couple years ago, and we were talking just about offensive line play in general. And God, I love listening to Cole talk offensive line play. He's one of the best. And Cole was like, when you play in the SEC, you're going to get got. It's just how it's going to happen. Um, I think the big thing you have to really look at for a guy like Will Anderson is you got to take away the easy stuff. Don't let him have a free inside rush. Don't overextend and, and let him blow you up and, and, and get to your quarterback in a half second. Don't let him wrap around on a stunt and come unblocked because what makes him great is he's an elite finisher. When he gets there, he makes the play. You know, I've, I've seen guys over the years, whether it's at Georgia or anywhere else in the SEC, they can get pressure on the quarterback, but they may finish one out of every two attempts or one out of every two and a half or three attempts that they have on the quarterback, whereas a guy like Will Anderson finishes two out of three or three out of four and rarely, rarely is a quarterback able to get away from him. Georgia has to do a good job of making sure that they don't give him easy opportunities at the quarterback. Make him have to beat your block. Make him have to beat a sound block, and he can do that. Um, but I, I think you're also going to see um, Darnell Washington 
lined up. I think Georgia can kind of manipulate where Will Anderson lines up and find their matchup based on how they line up because he's kind of a weak side guy. And, uh, you know, you might see Georgia line up with the tight end to the left, okay, uh, helping out Broderick Jones just to see if they can get Will Anderson lined up on Warren McClendon, who has more experience and has actually had to go up against Will Anderson before. Or you may see them line up, you know, that's the one-on-one you want. Or if, you know, or if uh, uh, Warren McClendon is having some issues with him, you may see them line up that way and then motion Darnell Washington over or motion uh, Brock Bowers down to get a chip on him, chip him with a running back. There's a lot of different things they can throw on him, but I'll say this about Will Anderson too. I think he's got 27 and a half tackles for a loss. He's a force in the run game. They, they've got to find a way to cut him off. And, uh, uh, you know, and when I say cut him off, I'm not saying cut his legs out from under him. I'm saying cut off the penetration, get a body on him, and get the run play started. And, and that's going to be a huge key for Georgia um, in this game. Brian Bivens, man, Brian, you are a loyal listener watcher and question asker and we appreciate it uh what do you think about the matchup between georgia's o-line and defensive and and their defensive lines uh, all right i'm getting I'm, I'm talking like i got marbles in my mouth which i do a lot of time anyway what do you think about the matchup between georgia's o-line and alabama's defensive line linebackers uh i'll start with that one first because brian's got another question and i'll answer that one separately it's it's a challenge it's a challenge now i Henry Toa Toto and um, uh, Christian Harris, not the best coverage guys. They can struggle in that area. They fly to the football. They're, they're solid tacklers. Um, but I do think Georgia is dealing with more when it comes to getting run plays started against Phil Mathis, against maybe DJ Dale if he plays, um, against Will Anderson, George is going to have to do a good job of combo blocking. And what I, what I mean by that is they double team a guy at the point of attack. They, they get like a double team going, and then one guy kind of slips off onto a linebacker. I'm over here messing with my microphone. Uh, but when one guy slips off to a linebacker, they've got to get that double team first to get the play started to maybe create one-on-ones with the running back and linebackers as opposed to the defensive lineman blowing the thing up before it begins. Um and then number two, uh, how do you see uh, – do you see George Pickens playing more of a role this week? I do. I mean, I, I know a lot of people think that it was just like a token appearance last week or whatever. Pickens played, I think, eight, ten, maybe a little bit more than that plays. That's what you expect when a guy hasn't played football in 11 months. Let him shake off some of the rust. I do think you're going to see a couple maybe more targets uh, for Pickens in this game. And I think it's valuable to have him out there because you've got a guy who can win 50-50 ball matchups. And you need that on third down against a really good football team. And, and George Pickens is a really good player. And, uh, you know, if you can get the ball to him a couple of times early in the game, you might be able to affect how Alabama covers you as a whole as opposed to, um, you know, you know, trying to maybe surprise them uh, later in the game with a shot to Pickens. If you can get him involved early, maybe they think you, you can get them kind of wondering, well, are they going to try to feature this guy? And do we need to kind of roll some things his way because he's dangerous? Uh, Dog 57, are Christopher Smith and Kendall Milton good to go? I'm going to say game time decision on Christopher Smith based on what I've heard thus far. Um, he's improving, but we'll see if he's able to go. Uh, I'm not 100% sure that he will be. Uh, I'm not 100% sure how effective he'll be. Um, you know, he's dealing with a knee injury. Those are tough for skilled guys to work on. But as of Wednesday, I would say 50 50. And, and there's another big practice for Georgia today. And then, you know, they'll practice again on Thursday and a little bit of a walkthrough on Friday. Uh, Kendall Milton, I would say there's a good chance he can, play, he's going to be able to play if they need him to play and if they want him to play and he shows he's ready. Uh, I do believe he'll be able to be healthy enough to play. Bigger mismatch for Alabama in the past game, Bowers or Cook? Bowers is the bigger mismatch, and I think Alabama knows that. I think he's going to get a lot of attention. Now, the, can Georgia scheme him open and keep him from shutting him down? I think so. Uh, but but I think they're going to they're going to pay some attention to Bowers, which is why my attention kind of turns to the outside. I, th I mean, obviously, Cook's been a big deal against them, too. I mean, he had a couple of really big catches last year, one for a touchdown and one that converted a third down. But Bowers is the biggest mismatch on Georgia's football team for any team they play. Uh, all right, funny questions. Uh, Josh Pate did his show yesterday from a location in Georgia. Was he at your place? 
Uh, he wouldn't tell us, but he was. Uh, there was some UGA stuff in the room. I don't have any UGA stuff in my house, so Josh was not at my house. If he was, we would have broke bread, man, and I would have enjoyed it. Big man crush on Josh Pate. Love ball guys. We'll give that guy a hug. I'm just joking, but I do love Josh. Uh, all right, Brett Gaffney. Do we see UGA go up tempo more often to wear down an already challenged Alabama D? Georgia, Georgia has a, a tempo plan. I don't think that's going to be the big part of their plan in this game, um, simply because, you know, it, it you have to simplify. If, if tempo is not what you do all the time, you have to be a little bit more simple. And I think Georgia places a larger emphasis on having options at the line of scrimmage than they do on catching a team out of place. And so that's that's why I think Georgia's going to use some tempo. You know, you see Georgia hit a 17-yard pass. They're going to sprint up to the line of scrimmage and try to hit you with an inside zone play or an RPO or a quick screen. Uh, that's going to be there. That's going to be something that Georgia uses. But I don't think that tempo is going to be a large part of the game plan uh, based on what we've seen out of Georgia this year. And I think Georgia at times maybe has gotten themselves into some trouble with tempo. You see Georgia hit, like I said, a 17, 18-yard game. Then they run up to the line. They run an inside zone. They bust it on the offensive line. They're looking at second and 12. So you got to be really careful with that. You've got to, you've got to execute when you do go tempo or you kind of defeat the purpose of it. Um, all right, everybody, that's it. For, uh, for this episode of the Junkyard Dogcast. We've blown through all the questions. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back tomorrow, hopefully with a full group, and we're going to do our picks, and uh, we're going to talk about that. Again, if you haven't hit that subscribe button, do so, and uh, you'll see how we pick the SEC championship game tomorrow, and we're ready for it. 4 o'clock Eastern time, CBS on Saturday, Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Like Rusty has said so many times, Georgia needs to get a win over Alabama in that building. And uh, they're favored to do it. We'll see if it takes place, and we'll tell you what we think is going to happen tomorrow. But for this episode of the Junkyard Dogcast, I am Jake Rowe from Dogs 24-7. Take it easy.